This is episode 37 of Entrepreneurs for a Change. If you like this podcast, please subscribe to our mailing list at entrepreneursforachange.com. Are you ready to be the change? If so, you've come to the right place. You are about to join a movement of entrepreneurs who are empowering people, saving the planet, and turning their passion into profits while creating the lifestyle of their dreams. If you don't believe us, check out our website at entrepreneursforachange.com, a place where you can be inspired, mentored, and supported by a tribe of change-making entrepreneurs just like you. Hello, innovative change makers. This is Lorna Lee, host of Entrepreneurs for Change, a web show that features entrepreneurs who are living on purpose, making a difference, and designing businesses that support life on their own terms. So, what do you think is the most effective way to change the world? If you're anything like me, you've probably pondered this question a great deal. When I reflect on anyone who has made a great contribution, such as Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, Madame Curie, Wangari Mathai, Albert Einstein, Nikola Tesla, I doubt a single one was thinking, what can I do that would massively impact a large swath of the human population so that what I did would be considered in history as world-changing. These change-makers were acting wholeheartedly from passion, a determination to find solutions to problems that they cared deeply about, and they had a tireless commitment to contribute to something bigger than themselves. In my opinion, world-changing is not the exclusive domain of the brilliant minority who have the genius, resources, and support networks to invent something that's game-changing. Anyone who wants to make a difference can be a world changer. You don't have to be a disruptive technologist or an inventor. Everyone has a unique zone of genius and can make a valuable contribution. So, what's the most effective way to change the world? For me, there are two answers, which can both occur simultaneously. Number one, the outer game approach. Create a game-changing solution that addresses an urgent social or environmental concern that creates significant positive and minimal negative impact on people or the environment. And number two, the inner game approach. Change yourself. Be the change that you want to see in the world. So what does it take to design a game-changing solution to one of the world's most pressing social concerns? Jane Chen, co-founder of Embrace Innovations, will tell us how. Embrace Innovations is a hybrid social enterprise that produces a low-cost infant warmer designed to help the millions of vulnerable premature babies born every year in developing countries survive and thrive. Unlike traditional incubators that cost up to $20,000 and require electricity and skilled technicians to run, The Embrace Infant Warmer costs around $200 and can be handled by anybody. The device is safe and intuitive to use, it requires no electricity, has no moving parts, and is portable, washable, and reusable. In this in-depth interview, Jane shares her in-the-trenches story of how she and her co-founders were presented with an urgent need, then designed a high-tech, low-cost solution and validated their market to verify that their product would truly serve those at the bottom of the pyramid. You will learn the market research process they followed in order to come up with a viable product idea, the market validation process they used to determine whether their prototype truly served the target customers and how it needed to be improved, why they chose a hybrid for-profit, non-profit business model and how this structure allows half the organization to focus on developing the best healthcare products for their market, while the other half distributes them profitably. The three stages of designing for innovation, and the keys to finding and approaching impact investors to fund your social enterprise. Resources, tools, and people mentioned can be found in the show notes at entrepreneursforchange.com slash 37. Before we hop into the interview, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why it is that some change makers, like Christine, are able to spark a movement, raise millions, and make massive world-changing impact with ease? It's almost as if the universe and everyone else is conspiring to help them. 
with about 20 plus years in the social change sector and 70 plus interviews under my belt, I've noticed that the most powerful change makers have seven things in common. I'll call them the seven keys to massive positive impact. The great news is you don't have to be born rich or be some kind of genius inventor. In fact, anyone can own these keys. So I've created a free video training to show you what they are and how to use them. So head on over to changemakerdojo.com slash gift to get it today. Now, before diving into the interview, I want to encourage you to rate, review, and download Entrepreneurs for a Change on iTunes. This really helps us reach more people with inspiring stories of entrepreneurs who are changing the world. Also, if these stories inspire you to start a world-changing business of your own, head over to our website at entrepreneursforachange.com and download the Business Changemakers Toolkit to get a jump start today. Now on to the show. So Jane, it's such an honor to have you with us here on the show. I have to give you a confession. I've always dreamed about doing something that you guys have done with the Embrace to come up with a truly game-changing, world-changing technology innovation that has really improved the lives of many, many people who desperately need it. So I'd love for you to introduce to my audience who you are, what you and your company does, and how you got to um, where you are now. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, pleasure to be on the show and uh, about Embrace. So I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Embrace and Embrace Innovations. We are a social enterprise that's developed a low-cost infant warmer to help vulnerable babies around the world. Um, so the, the backdrop to this is about 20 million premature and low birth weight babies are born every year, primarily in developing countries. Uh, Three million babies die in the first 28 days of their life. One of the biggest problems they face is regulating their own body temperature or staying warm. And that is the primary function of an incubator. But incubators cost up to $20,000. They require a constant supply of electricity. They're difficult to operate. So you're not going to find them in, in rural areas in these countries. And so what my team and I have come up with is the Embrace Infant Warmer. It looks like a little sleeping bag for an infant. The core technology is a pouch of a wax-like substance. It's called a phase change material that has a melting point of 37 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees Fahrenheit, so human body temperature. And the key to this is once you melt the wax, it's able to maintain a constant temperature for up to eight hours at a stretch. I and mean, you can reheat it over and over again. So that wax pouch sits in a little compartment in the back of the sleeping bag. And it's a really safe, effective way to regulate the temperature of newborns. So we developed this as a team uh, while I was at Stanford in 2007. We launched the venture once I graduated in 2008. And then the whole team relocated to India, where we spent the next couple of years refining, prototyping, doing clinical testing. The product has now been in the market for about two years, and we have helped about 50,000 babies, largely in India, uh, but with pilots now happening in 10 countries around the world. And our vision is to create a whole line of innovative medical technologies that are targeted at people in emerging markets that can't access traditional health care. So how much does Embrace cost? So we have two versions of the product. One cost is sits in a hospital setting. That costs less than $300. And there's one that sits in a home or community setting, and that costs about $100. And typically, who is purchasing the Embrace? Would it be the hospital or the community health care center or the mom? So it's all of the above. We sell directly to hospitals. We sell to government. So currently government is our biggest customer. And uh, once the government purchases it and brings it into their healthcare infrastructure, then it's provided free of cost to parents. We are also doing a pilot now where we are sending this home with community healthcare workers. And one of their mandates in India is to provide newborn care in the community setting. So the idea is that eventually every one of these these community healthcare workers would have an embrace device that they could cycle through these communities. So it's actually reusable. It's not a, a disposable type of device. 
Exactly. Yeah. The, everything is made to be reusable. It's a very rugged product, very, very easy to clean. So all of that has been given careful thought. Wow. I love it. This is so exciting. And I'm so intrigued by how you guys actually came up with this product idea. I think one of the things that I'm hoping to do one day is something similar, come up with a really game-changing business idea. But since I haven't quite come up with that idea yet, <laughs> I'm really having a great time interviewing entrepreneurs like you. So help me understand what was the aha moment that really caused you to decide that this was a product worth developing? Sure. So this actually came out of a class project at Stanford. There is a course at the design school. I was doing my MBA at the time, but there's a course at the design school that combines graduate students of all different disciplines to come together and develop affordable products for developing countries. So in my class, there were people from uh, the engineering school, the medical school, the law school. It's a very interdisciplinary course. So the year that I took this course, I teamed up with a computer science master's student, a PhD in electrical engineering, and another MBA. And the challenge that was posed to us was build a baby incubator that cost less than 1% of the cost of a traditional incubator, which I mentioned is about $20,000. And the class had partnered with an NGO in Nepal to come up with this challenge because they recognized a lack of incubators as one of the, the big problems and one of the things that was leading leading to these very high rates of um, infant mortality. And so the first thing we did was to go out into the field and understand firsthand what was happening. And something very interesting happened as we did that. So the first trip we made was to Kathmandu, to the, the capital of Nepal. And we would go to these tertiary level hospitals where there were, in fact, many donated incubators. Uh, and so cost wasn't the problem. But there was no electricity to power these incubators, right? Yeah. And... <laughs> I know, right? In a lot of these countries, they're constantly faced with blackouts. Right, exactly, exactly. And there was no one trained on how to use them. And if a, if a part broke, there were no spare parts for replacement. Oftentimes, the instructions would be in German. And so there were oh, a host no. of other issues that were leading to these incubators not working in these facilities. So it wasn't a matter just of cost. It was the fact that these machines that were developed for Western markets were just not suitable for these developing country contexts. You couple that with the fact that in many many of these countries, 50% or more births take place in the home. They're not even happening in the hospital, right? And so you also need something that can be used in a home setting that's easy enough for a mother or a midwife or a community healthcare worker to use. And so I think that was our aha moment when we realized, hey, we're not just developing a lower cost version of what exists today that sits in a hospital that's used by a doctor. We're trying to serve a very different population, right? Our product is going to go to small clinics and rural areas that don't have electricity, or they're going to go home directly with moms who are giving birth in homes instead of institutions. And so that really led us to our insights, because now we're talking about a product that doesn't require constant electricity, that is super, super intuitive to use, such that an illiterate woman or an uneducated woman can use it. It's got to be portable. It's got to be reusable. It's got to be really easy to clean. And so I think once we framed the problem in that way and figured out what were the specifications that were needed for these contexts, then the answer came to us rather easily. Wow. Okay. So at this time, you got, were you guys still students? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we were still students. We came up with a concept. We did lots of brainstorming, prototyping. By the end of the class, we had an idea. And we realized that if we weren't going to take it forward, no one else was going to. And so we started applying to different grants, different uh, business uh, plan competitions. And as we started to uh, kind of get our first bits of funding for this, we made the commitment that we were going to do this and we were going to move to India to get this off the ground. Wow. So in the, the beginning stages when you were still students in this course, when did you go to Nepal? Was this during your uh, holidays? Did you all just mm -hmm. pay for your own plane tickets to go? 
So the class sponsors one student to go, um, and that was my co-founder, Linus. And then I, in fact, and, and so that was all done through the class. And then I did a separate trip to India on my own shortly thereafter and took some of the prototypes we had to the various villages. And so those were the first couple of trips. But it became clear very quickly that in order to truly make our product locally appropriate and to truly serve the customers we wanted to, it wasn't enough to be making these trips. You know, we needed to be living and breathing the the culture and the environment that we uh, were, were trying to make this successful in. And so that was why the decision to move. That is a really big commitment to a mission and a vision because living in India is really not easy, um, especially <laughs> if you're used to the comforts of the West. I mean, I've been to India, oh gosh, um, to at least twice, and it is, it's intense over there. I mean, it is like you see the whole cycle of life and survival right in your face. So there's so many people and it's, you know, it's really hard for a lot of them. Where did you guys decide to relocate to? Were you going to more like the villages and, and living in like the, the rural areas or did you go to a big city? No, we, we stationed ourselves in a big city because we needed the ability to access rural areas quickly, but at the same time, we needed access to prototyping facilities, manufacturing facilities, etc. And so we moved to Bangalore, which uh, was, a, was a great choice for us, given that there are many startups in Indian social enterprises in particular that are set up there. So it was a great uh, ecosystem for us to do this work. And as I said, it was, it was easy to access the types of areas that we wanted to access, you know, with in a few hours, and yet we were able to find a lot of local partners and supporters that really propelled this forward. But yes, living in India is very, very difficult. I've lived in Tanzania, and I've lived in China, and uh, India by <laughs> far is the most difficult place I've ever lived. Wow. Yeah, I used to live in China, too. I lived in Shanghai. Where did you live? I lived in Nanjing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's challenging. Uh, communist China can be... Oh, a, a place <laughs> that causes you to develop a lot of patience. <laughs> yes. Well, I always say that about India. I think it teaches you to be both very aggressive and very patient at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's like a, a, an incredible balance of traits, personality traits. <laughs> Okay, so first question before I hop into your background as well. So with the phase change material, who came up with that? Like why, you know, how did you know that there was this phase change material that would be a great and key component of your uh, device? Yeah, well, I think we we basically wanted to figure out a way to warm the infant without the need for electricity. And so we went back to high school physics, right? And and the concept that when a material changes phases from a solid to a liquid, let's say, or, or a liquid to a solid, it does so at one constant temperature. And so the key was finding a substance with a very specific melting point of human body temperature. So it was something that all of us brainstormed together. We actually read about the use of phase change materials in other applications. Someone at MIT had tried to do a vaccine incubator out of phase change material. It's been used in the past to regulate the temperature of buildings, of cell phone towers. And so the, the, this idea of phase change material for temperature regulation is not novel at all. It was really taking that concept and applying it to the baby incubator. And in my mind, that is what innovation is in many ways. It's, it's connecting the dots and figuring out different pieces that are out there and kind of bringing it together and applying it in new ways. Wow. Okay, wow. cool. Was I, I, when I think about the phase change material, I think about these hand warming packs mm -hmm. that you can yep. get in camping stores. And so I thought, oh, wow, maybe someone yeah. in their team was like, oh, I use this when I go camping. Let's, let's use this device well, for, right. for the incubator. Well, that's exactly what the inspiration was. In fact, we went to an REI and bought a bunch of camping materials. The problem <laughs> with those, yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. But the problem with those we discovered was that they're very prone to overheating. And when you're dealing with a sick baby, you really need an accurate temperature, right? A very precise temperature. And so that's what the phase change material was able to achieve. Okay, great. That That's so awesome that you identified how you needed to modify and improve that already existing product to serve your needs. 
So let me understand your background too, because this is not your first experience in you know working with an organization that is addressing uh, social issues. You have a history of NGO work, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So my background is out of college. I did uh, management consulting for a few years. I had the opportunity to go to Hong Kong to do this work, which was very exciting because it took me to many places across Asia. I got to do some very cool client projects, but it wasn't something that I was necessarily very excited about. And I think I wanted to do something that just had a lot more personal meaning to me than, you know, making rich companies richer. And so I ended up finding a cause that just really, really struck a chord with me reading the New York Times one day, this was back in 2002, I read an article about the AIDS epidemic in central China, in, in Henan province, and actually many of the provinces in that, in that area. And what had happened was in the 90s, millions of poor farmers contracted HIV through selling their blood. But the way it was collected was unsanitary. Um, and so this was actually a big government initiative where they would pool people's blood together separate the plasma, which is what was needed, and then re-inject every uh, donor with the remaining red blood cells, believing that it would allow them to generate blood more quickly. So as a result of this, about 60 to 80 percent of the adult population was HIV positive in the villages that I ended up working in. And when I read this, I was just uh, horrified, but light bulb kind of went off in my head where I realized that we are amongst the luckiest people on this planet, but we've, we've won the genetic lottery, as, as Warren Buffett says. You know, we, I could have just as easily been born into this different life and suffered this terrible fate as a, as a result. And so I decided at that point that I was going to use the opportunities and, and privileges I'd been given to do something about this situation. And so I, I quit my job. I joined an NGO that was providing support to all of the orphans that were left behind as a result of this epidemic. And over the course of a few years, we helped several thousand orphans obtain an education. But more importantly, the Chinese government stepped up and began providing free education to all of the orphans in these afflicted areas and free antiretroviral drugs to all of the HIV positive patients. So it was a really special experience in that I was able to see that a small group of dedicated people through hard work and, and commitment could achieve social impact in, in a really big way. And I think that really set the course for everything I wanted to do following. So after that, I spent a few months working with the Clinton Foundation in Tanzania, uh, also on HIV AIDS issues. And it was through this combination of experiences that I began to witness this, this enormous disparity in healthcare between developed and developing countries. You know, in the U.S., anyone who needs AIDS medication can get it. But in China and in Africa, I would meet so many people who lost their lives because they couldn't access these medications. You know, and the, and the most frustrating part of it was these are medications that exist. And so it became a personal passion of mine at that time to try to bridge this disparity in healthcare that I saw. And Embrace is a, a platform for me to do that. You know, the Embrace is not just about one product. It's how do we use innovation and technology to create a line of products that is going to reduce infant deaths in a major way. Wow, I really love that vision. And I, I look forward to seeing more of the products that you guys come out with. So you guys have a hybrid for profit nonprofit business model. I'm, I'm curious as to why you set it up this way. I actually interviewed some another company that has a similar structure as well. So it's not at, at all that common, but it seems to really work for Runa, which is a uh, tea company that exports um, sustainably harvested Wayusa from Ecuador to uh, Western markets. Uh, so I'm curious how you guys set up the structure that allows both entities to mutually support each other in the work that you do. Sure. So I'll just explain the rationale and then how it works. Um, we started as a nonprofit, as a 501c3 uh, back in 2008. And about a year, year and a half into this, we realized that 
we needed to raise a lot more capital than we had anticipated to do what we wanted to do. I always laugh because whenever I need comic relief, I basically read our first business plans. (laughs) 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 So how how much money did you think you had to raise and how much money did you actually have to raise, if you don't mind sharing? No, no, I don't mind sharing. Um, So we thought we would need about a million dollars and two people on staff and that we could achieve global expansion of the product <laughs> with that. That's, I mean, that's we're ambitious. so nice. <laughs> yes, we're so nice. But the funny thing is so many people read this business plan and I feel like no one raised an eyebrow. <laughs> <laughs> no one just burst out laughing or, right. I mean, okay, yeah. uh, gosh, that's such a straight poker face <laughs> attitude. And completely selectively ignored it, you know, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so we, uh, but we realized as we were doing this, that, Hey, this is a medical device. We need to do clinical testing, manufacturing, distribution. I mean, it's, it's very expensive to do something like this. Um, and so we ended up spinning out a for-profit arm of the business because at that time, you were also seeing the emergence of a lot of impact investors, right? Social impact investors who were interested in investing in for-profit companies with a social mission. And a number of them approached us saying, if you guys were for-profit, we would be willing to invest in this. At the same time, we realized that not all segments of the population can be served by market forces. There is room for, not just room, but there's a need for philanthropy to serve the poorest of the poor. And so what we ended up doing was creating two organizations. The nonprofit holds the intellectual property for the infant warmers. It takes philanthropy donations to provide the product free of cost to the poorest areas all through NGO partners. And in addition to that, it complements the products with programs. And by that, I mean educational programs on things like hypothermia education, breastfeeding, kangaroo mother care, hygiene, you know, all the other things that are impacting infant mortality beyond just keeping the baby warm. The for-profit licenses the technology from the nonprofit. It sells the product to governments, to private clinics, to paying entities, does all the manufacturing and and distribution that supports that. And all of the research and development uh, for new products is done under the nonprofit. So it's really a structure that allows us to leverage both private capital as well as philanthropic capital in order for us to help as many babies as possible. That is brilliant. Did you receive mentorship in order to figure this out, how to set up the structure? Well, we definitely brainstormed with a number of different people, but as we were looking for examples, we couldn't really find many out there. And so, you know, we realized that we were doing something very new. And I think that's what innovation is. It's not just innovating around products or services, but new business models as well, new structures. And and that's what this is for us. So... So yes, we definitely got advice from many different people, but given that it's not a typical structure, I I feel like we were writing the rules as we were going. So in the beginning, when you started fundraising and when you spun off to a for-profit model in order to attract impact investors, what was your experience in raising VC investment? Did you go to different specific organizations um, that were helpful or did you reach out to friends and family first? Can you walk us through that process of how you were able to eventually raise the funds that you needed to support that very expensive development process? Sure. So the first thing we did was reach out to people who had supported us as a nonprofit and test the idea with them. And there are a couple of individuals who were really on board with it and said, hey, if, you know, if we can make this whole thing sustainable over time, then the impact of my contribution is going to go a lot further. And so uh, we convinced some of them to be the first angel investors. In the meanwhile, we um, started to reach out to all of the typical social impact investors out there. One in particular ended up being Vinod Kosla's impact fund. At the time, Vinod had just started his impact fund. And the funny thing is I had read about him doing this probably 
a year or even more prior to him actually setting up the fund and had reached out to him, I don't know, maybe five or six times. And he said, no, or just wasn't able to meet with me all of those times. And then finally, he took a meeting with me. And it was great. He really understood what we were trying to do. He was on board with the vision. Vinod's a really big thinker. And I, it was it's never been about this single product for him, but about us you know, changing the landscape of healthcare in these countries. And he really believed in that. And so we met with him, I think it was on a Friday, we met with him for three hours. And by the end of the week, we had a term sheet. And so that ended up being our first investor. And alongside that, we raised money from Capricorn Investment Group, which is uh, uh, affiliated with Jeff Skoll. And he's also very much kind of immersed in a thought leader in the social enterprise space. So we found two investors that again, really were aligned in terms of our values and the impact we wanted to create. Remind me uh, what Vinod Kosla is known for again. So Vinod was um, the founder of one of the founders of Sun Microsystems and is one of the biggest um, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Okay, great. And so um, he now has an impact investing fund. So prior to yeah. that, he would inv invest in, in technology startups. And now he's looking towards uh, social enterprise organizations. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So he's had Kosla Ventures is his uh, typical venture investing arm. And that's been running for, for many years now. And then this impact fund was started about two years ago. Okay, great. Wow. Uh, that is pretty persistent. You, you guys approached him five times. <laughs> I love that. I think it can be so discouraging, especially when you're just starting off and nobody knows who you are. And, you know, a lot of these um, influencers, you know, they're busy. They don't have the time. So to be able to uh, be persistent and, you know, keep your chin up, even though you're getting no's <laughs> from the beginning, that, that takes a lot of courage. Right. Well, that's, I think, one of the most important aspects of being an entrepreneur is tenacity. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Are you guys profitable? No, not yet. Not yet. It'll be a few more years before we are profitable. Okay. Okay. All right. And so when you guys designed the product? Was it a member of the team, your original, your founding team that designed the product? Or did you find different designers to come up with prototypes and then from there identify a manufacturer in Bangalore? No, it was really our team. So we came up with the product, as I said, a concept at the end of the class. We took it to India. We figured out how to do prototyping in-house, all the things that are so easily done at various sites or universities in the U.S. We don't, you know, in India, you don't have facilities like that. And so we had to learn how to figure, we just had to figure out how to do everything in-house, which was um, challenging and fun at the same time. But I think one of the core principles of the design school and design thinking, which is because a popular term is that creativity and design, it's not necessarily innate. If you follow a process, it can lead to creative outcomes, right? It can likely lead to creative outcomes. And that process involves empathy. So truly understanding who your customers are, what their needs are, being able to stand in their shoes, prototyping. So just getting out there and building. And that's what we would do is, is get out there, build with whatever materials we did have, and then go test and iterate. And so we would take those prototypes, go into the field, ask mothers, midwives, nurses, doctors for feedback, and, and sometimes co-create with them. And so the product, as simple as it looks, actually went through hundreds of iterations through that process in order to arrive at what we have now. So later in the process, of course, we had to, to team up with local manufacturers who were also very critical in the prototyping process. But even that is interesting because many of the manufacturers couldn't produce our product to the quality that we needed. And we ended up bringing a lot of those capabilities in-house. So we currently do work with some contract manufacturers and we do some of our own manufacturing. But everything is then quality inspected at the Embrace facility, which meets international regulatory standards. You know, safety is of utmost importance to us given that this is a medical device. And then everything gets shipped out from our facility in India. So in the beginning, when you guys were prototyping, was it one member of your team with a sewing machine? 
kind of. I mean, it, re- it was really all of us. People always ask, like, was there one person that came up with this? It wasn't. And and that's what we believe that, you know, th- there should be no ownership of ideas, you know, innovation and design. It's a group effort. And that's exactly what would happen. You know, we would just keep building on each other's ideas. Yeah, I literally have, have pictures of us with sewing machines and <laughs> lots of fake baby dolls. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. Would you be willing to share some of those photos with us? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, of course. great. Wow. I picture you guys working really late at night trying to put these uh, prototypes together by hand. Yep. Yeah, well, <laughs> a lot of it was that. Um, my The professor who taught the class, his wife was a seamstress, and so she ended up doing a lot of the nicer prototypes a bit later on. <laughs> um, and then we would literally find people who ran these little uh, shops on the road in India who would stitch together some of those early prototypes. So you just have to be really resourceful and creative in how you go about prototyping. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, hey, there's a lot you can make using Big Stitch. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's right. And duct tape. Yeah, yeah, duct tape. Yeah, Velcro also. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. (laughs) So what do you love most about your business? Are you inspired to get up every day and excited about your the, the day ahead of you? Yeah, I am. And I I think about it from a couple of different perspectives. I think, you know, entrepreneurship in general, I I love being an entrepreneur. I love facing new challenges, figuring out how to tackle them. I think it stretches you to your fullest capacity every single day. And I, I just love that about my job. I think with Embrace specifically, I love that I get to see so much, uh, I don't know how to phrase it, but but so much altruism and good intention and so much beauty in that what we're trying to do here is make social impact, starting with saving the lives of infants. And there was a period of time where I would get really frustrated. You know, living in India, you see some pretty terrible things ranging from, you know, some of the the worst infrastructure and healthcare, corruption to very unethical practices by doctors who are, you know, trying to make an extra dollar. And so you see these things and, and it's easy to become jaded. And I understand why people do become jaded. But it, it struck me one day that for every terrible thing that I see, I also get to see something really beautiful and really amazing, you know, from all the people who've come together to help this effort. And that must be, you know, over 10,000 people in my, in my estimates, and maybe many more than that, who have come together to donate, to volunteer, to help this in some way or another. To the doctors out there, out there that I meet who refuse to charge their patients anything, who are up until 2 a.m. seeing patients because they genuinely care about their work to the mothers that I meet whom no matter how poor or impoverished or uneducated will do anything, will go to any length to save their babies. And that that's truly, truly beautiful. And I think that's what I hope our technology is, is able to capture. I hope it's able to magnify the intentions of, of these, you know, courageous and and selfless people. And that part of my work, I, I really love That is really, really inspiring. And I think that is the beauty and the power of aligning a for-profit business with a, a social or environmental mission and vision. Because I think that, you know, entrepreneurs, we really are, we're, we're trying to usually forge a new path for your, yourself or your business. And, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, challenges that entrepreneurs face, like having to confront fear every day or overwhelm or, you know, not necessarily knowing what the best path of action might be. In addition to dealing with other, you know, players in the market and, you know, or who associate with your business, sometimes there's agendas at play. You don't necessarily know if everyone is has a uh, uh, goodwill and an ethical approach sometimes you know I can imagine in India it might also be a difficult business environment too because of all the corruption as well so Mm -hmm. um, I can totally see how a lot of entrepreneurs would get very jaded or frustrated and uh, and and give up so congratulations (laughs) kudos to you guys for you know forging ahead with this vision that you guys have 
Thank you. No, it's been it's been really rewarding, and we obviously didn't do it alone. There have been so many supporters along the way that have uh, just rooted for us and been champions of this. So it's been an incredible team effort. What does your typical day look like these days now that you're not in India? Um, you know, it's different. So right now I uh, am focused on fundraising. We're raising a, a Series B round. We're looking at the international expansion of the product. And so looking at to a number of different organizations that we can partner with in that effort. We're working on uh, moving forward with an independent evaluation of Embrace that would for the first time not only look at the efficacy of the product, but how it's impacting things like mortality and morbidity, you know, how it's impacting the outcome of these children. And so we're talking about a very large, large study that would take place over the course of several years. And we have some really exciting researchers at Stanford and Harvard who are going to be leading this. And so I've been trying to uh, just uh, move everyone forward on this. Uh, and that, of course, would also lead the way for this, hopefully, to be adopted as a, as a standard of care around the world. And then in addition to that, looking at what are opportunities for new products, which the team is really, really psyched about. So going back to a lot of the design thinking that I mentioned, we have a team on the ground in India that's starting to work on uh, various new concepts. Meanwhile, I'm here in the U.S. talking to a number of, of partners, technology partners that we might be able to partner with in coming up with the next product. What are some exciting concepts that you guys are exploring right now? Well, it's it's really too early to be able to to talk about them okay, publicly. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Do you guys have a plan uh, some some day to IPO? Um, maybe. I mean, we uh, you know, I, I don't I don't think we have necessarily thought about it in terms of building a company to exit. You know, we're building the company to build the company, and so I, I think we are more focused on this this platform, this process, building a culture of innovation, coming out with with what's next, and as I said, figuring out what are the the distribution strategies to enable the global expansion of this. But yeah, an exit could be could be possible somewhere down the line. Okay. Knowing what you know now, if you were to look back at your experience growing Embrace, if you had the opportunity to potentially start over again from square one, what might you do differently? Was there any mistake that you made along the way that you would completely do differently so that, and, and if you could help us understand what that mistake might have been and, and why, that would also help us understand what to avoid uh, in our entrepreneurial ventures as well. Yeah. I mean, I could probably talk about a million of those and I, you know, I, I really embrace failure. I think it's important to reflect on lessons learned. For the sake of time, I will focus on two very important lessons. One is the kind of team that you build, right? And everyone talks about this, but I think for the kind of work we're doing and especially working in an emerging market, it's even more important. So we walked into this as founders having this very Silicon Valley approach of thinking, you know, we just need to find passionate people. We'll figure it out once we get there. <laughs> and so that's what we did. We hired other young people. None of us had any experience in medical devices, in manufacturing, in distribution, in sales. And in Silicon Valley, you might be able to figure that out. In a country as complicated as India, I would strongly advise against taking that approach, right? Because you're dealing with laws and regulations that are very gray, that are uncertain, that may be arbitrary at times. You're dealing with an in, a, a distribution infrastructure that's not even there, right? That's not, that's not established. That's not set up. You're dealing with um, governments that are very difficult to work with. And then that ends up being, you know, one of your primary customers. There's so many things that compound the complexity of what you're working and you're serving some of the poorest cost people in the, in the world. And so what I would have done differently is bring in people right away who had a skill set that did complement the founders, uh, that did complement our vision, some of our technical expertise, 
and our, and our passion for this. So we did bring on people later on who, you know, we have a VP of, of quality assurance, for example, who has 20 years of experience in the field, was managing dozens of product lines. We've brought in someone who has spent his whole career doing sales of medical devices and pharmaceuticals in India, serving bottom of the pyramid uh, uh, markets. We have a new CEO who uh, was uh, the former head of Baxter Asia Pacific and ran their operations for 10 years. So we've brought in people today. I think we have a very strong team that I'm super excited about. I wish I had had the foresight to think about how do you build a truly complementary team that combines, again, both the passion of the founders and their vision with people who have some, some really solid skill sets and deep expertise in these areas. So that's one thing I would have done differently. I think the other, and this is just on a more personal note. Sure. Is um, I would have paid a lot more attention to work-life balance. Oh my (laughs) God. (laughs) (laughs) I think we all, we all, we all struggle with that. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And I think a lot of people struggle with this, but you know, when I was in India, I was literally just doing embrace 24 seven every weekend. I never went out. I never hung out with friends. I didn't bother to build a community or a social network when I was out there because I was so focused on this one goal. And I finally realized at one point that that's completely unsustainable. And it's actually doing a huge disservice to myself, as well as the mission and as well as the company. Because unless you are happy, then I don't think you have the capacity to be a great leader or a great manager or a great entrepreneur. And so I often say this to people, focus on what makes you happy, especially when you are running you know, a marathon, not, not a sprint, when you're trying to um, create a change in a really big way that's just going to take time. And so you need to take care of yourself in the process. One of the key of the lessons things. that I've been learning doing this interview series, in fact, yeah. is the importance is the- of giving mm-hmm. from a full from cup. A full- Mm, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. If you're depleted, if you're depleted, then there's, you know, you're going to limit your ability to truly give, um, in addition to truly serve the people that you're trying to serve. Exactly. Exactly. It was funny. I was home in LA one weekend hanging out with my mom and I was so happy at the end of that weekend. I was, you know, sending thank you emails to a bunch of my staff and I kind of caught myself in the middle. I was like, Oh, this is unusual. I don't, I don't usually do this. <laughs> unfortunately, but I realized it was because I had just had this lovely weekend and I was so happy that I was able to, you know, project that joy and, and be much more appreciative of the people who are working with me. So yeah, I completely agree with you. Okay. So we're uh, coming to the end of our interview. I'd like to leave you with the last few questions. I love asking this question, especially of social entrepreneurs. Is this business your life purpose? And if not, what is? Uh, yes, it is. As I said, uh, this is something that I've wanted to do from before starting Embrace. I think Embrace in its current form, in terms of just being a baby warmer company, that is not my life purpose, although I find that extremely meaningful. My life purpose is building a platform by which we truly change the landscape of healthcare through these disruptive technologies. So absolutely, this is my life purpose. So as a social entrepreneur, Jane, what do you think is the most effective way to change the world? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm biased towards, towards healthcare, given that healthcare, in my mind, is it's so critical and it comes before everything else in that there is no development if you don't have basic health. And I think basic healthcare should be a right. It should be a human right. Healthcare is one of the biggest drivers of poverty. When people are living day to day and they experience something, and I've seen this over and over again, I mean, specific to Embrace, I've seen families take out hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in loans. And these are families that are making two or three dollars a day. They will be paying these loans back for the rest of their lives. And this is just, you know, one example. Um, And so, you know, that's why I've decided to to dedicate um, my life to this particular field. Um, but I do think another another area that's very important in development is job creation, right? And as mm-hmm. I think about poverty alleviation, that does occur to me 
a lot because when I'm out there, I meet so many people in these settings who are um, who are eager to to lift themselves out of poverty, but don't have the education, right? And so that's that's incredibly important, um, or the resources, or the job opportunities. And I think one of the most important things we can do is is help people to help themselves. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. How can we best stay in touch with you? You can find me on Twitter okay, at Jane Marie Chen and at Embrace Warmer or at Embrace Inov. <laughs> Embrace N I N N O V. So I uh, would love if everyone keeps updated on our work and, and what we're up to and support us in any way that you can. Fantastic. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your really inspiring and interesting story. Thank you. Thanks, folks, for listening to the Entrepreneurs for Change podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us reach more people with inspiring stories like this one by giving us a five-star rating in iTunes. If this podcast inspires you to join the movement of change-making entrepreneurs, we'd love to give you a jumpstart with our free Business Changemakers Toolkit, which you can download at www.entrepreneursforachange.com slash join. If you have a change maker in mind you'd love for us to interview, go to entrepreneursforachange.com slash suggest and tell us who and why. Finally, feel free to stop by facebook.com slash entrepreneursforachange to share your thoughts and say hello.